Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this morning's Ask ICAST webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to be back with you after uh, a couple of weeks uh, off, and uh, thank you very much to uh, Jeremy Clark and also Michelle Mullen for the last couple of weeks uh, taking the, the host role and uh, taking you through the last few Ask ICAST webinars. This weekly series of webinars, of course, gives members the opportunity to find out more and ask questions from the in-house experts here at ICAST on a range of topics. For those that uh, are joining us for the first few times, uh, I'm David Mingus and I'm the Director of Practice here at ICAST and I'll be guiding you through this webinar. I do have to just mention uh, at the top that uh, this webinar provides general commentary on the topics under discussion uh, and should be relied upon as definitive advice. It's inevitable that we'll not have access to all the facts uh, that you find yourself in, particularly if we get to uh, or when we get to the Q and A section. So as always, we expect our members to use professional judgment and uh, seek other appropriate professional or legal advice where appropriate. So in this webinar, we're going to look at some of the latest developments and hot topics which have arisen in the last few weeks and, we've put, and that we've not managed to cover yet in any of the Ask ICAST webinars. It also gives you the opportunity to uh, round up and ask questions on any topic which is concerning you at this time. Over recent weeks, there have certainly been uh, further developments in relation to many of the COVID support measures. The Chancellor's summer statement earlier this month included a range of measures to provide a plan for jobs and also kickstart an economic recovery. We've also seen the return of making tax digital onto the agenda following government announcements last week. So taking you through the detail of these and other recent developments and available to also answer your questions later on, uh, alongside me are two very familiar faces uh, to those of you who are regular attendees of these Ask ICAST webinar series. I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Jeremy Clark, who's the Assistant Director within the Practice Support Team here at ICAST. Jeremy has significant experience in providing advice, counsel and support to members in practice, particularly all aspects of practice management, including succession planning, practice M&As, staff issues and strategy. I'm also pleased to be joined again by Justine Rukamini, who is Head of Tax, Scottish Taxes, Employment Taxes and the ICAST Tax Community here at ICAST. Justine represents ICAST at several HMRC and industry forums, including HMRC's Employment and Payroll Group and the Association of Accounting Technicians Employment and Pensions Panel. So certainly well placed to cover a lot of the employment uh, benefit uh, support schemes that are there uh, out there at the moment. Justine is also a member of the Scottish Tax Policy Forum, which is a collaboration between ICAS and the CIOT. But before we kick off, just a few housekeeping matters uh, to remind you of uh, for those who are uh, not familiar with these uh, webinars. You can, of course, submit any questions uh, that you want during the course of the webinar. There is the Q&A uh, facility button uh, down at the bottom of the screen. Please just click on that, uh, ask your question, and uh, we will try and get round and answer that uh, later on during the, the, the Q&A session. Questions submitted are, of course, only view viewable to the presenters for this webinar. That's myself, Jeremy and Justine. Um, and we won't identify who the questions come from specifically. So uh, please don't feel shy about asking any of the questions. We are, of course, recording this webinar and it will be made available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or, of course, share it with any others. And, and everyone on the webinar is automatically muted. Uh, so for everyone who is uh, still continuing to, to work from home at the moment, uh, don't be concerned about any of the background noise wherever you are. So as I say, we look, do look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinar. Um, and of course, we will try and get to as many of those as possible. Um, if we don't manage to get through all the questions, we will to, uh, put together a Q&A document which will be available after the webinar um, so that we'll make sure that all the question areas are answered. So without further ado, uh, across to you, Justine, to, to start off. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And um, here I am in the what I assume will be the sunny Pennines at some point today. Um, so I've just got a few bits and bobs. There's been quite a, um, a raft of new information coming through over the last uh, couple of weeks. 
in terms of uh, what else is going to be available to employers to use uh, to, to help them over the over the next few months. Um, so just uh, wanted to touch on record keeping issues for the second part of the CJRS. Um, I wanted to emphasize this because um, the revenues um, focus, should I say, is, is probably now turning to um, looking at whether people have actually complied with the scheme or not properly. Um, and we'll see a bit more of that later. Um, so what I wanted to, to say today was that um, there is an additional record keeping re requirement now uh, for a minimum of six years for the particular claims that are made under the second part of CJRS. Um, that means that employers must keep a record for six years of the number of hours the employees would usually work in the claim um, the number of hours that they have been or will work in the claim, so that's the actual hours worked, and the number of hours that they will have been furloughed for within that claim period. And the employer must also keep a written agreement which describes those flexible furlough hours. So that's very, very important um, information that needs to be stashed away for six years. So I mentioned usual hours. Um, I would say that the, if I asked you to look at the claim for usual hours, you would probably think that you would all claim it in the same way. I could probably ask you all to uh, scratch it out on a piece of paper now, and I bet you'd all do it in the same way. But I've got a funny feeling you might not do it quite like this, because HMRC has now um, set out only about four days ago, in fact, um, the different steps that they would like to, um, to use for calculating what the usual hours are. So under the flexible furlough scheme, which as we know runs from July to October, um, the employee, employer must enter the actual hours worked and the usual hours worked to then arrive at the furlough claim. Okay, so there's a number of steps that need to be taken and we've obtained clarification from HMRC on this because their guidance was not clear. And in fact, I put at the bottom of this slide, there's a link to the guidance, but it might not yet have been updated. It hadn't been updated last time I looked at it, which was yesterday morning. So you need to take care about all of this. So step one, You've got to find out what the contracted hours were. So what is in the contract of employment at the last pay period, which ended on or before the 19th of March. So I'm going to say for in this example that the person is working for 40 hours. OK, so that's what they're contracted to work. So then you need to look at the number of days in each repeat working period. So a repeat working period. HMRC has assumed that, say for example, if someone comes in uh, every Monday and Tuesday to work and the rest of the week they're on furlough. So that would mean that the repeat working period is seven days because you have to include the non-working days. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then you divide the answer in step one by the result of step two. So we've got 40 hours divided by seven in this example, okay? So then you need to look at what are the actual number of days in the pay period to which the claim relates. So if you've got August, that's 31 days. If it's September, it's 30. If it's October, it's 31 again. So let's say we're making a claim for August. We'll take 31 days times 5.71. So that gives us 177.01. And then you have to, if you've not got a whole figure at the end of that calculation, you round it up to the nearest whole number. So that gives us 172 usual hours. So that is how you do the usual hours calculation. I know quite a few people who have not done it like that. But HMRC has confirmed only last week that that is how it must be done.
Okay, so I'll move on to the next slide then. Now, the reason why I'm going on about all of this and why the claims have got to be spot on and why so many records have got to be kept for six years is because on the 9th of July, um, an example was made of a chap in the West Midlands who was arrested for suspected half a million pound CJRS fraud. He was also at the same time arrested for another multi-million pound fraud that was unconnected to CJRS and some money laundering offences with eight other people. Um, over a hundred HMRC officers were involved in that. So this is pretty heavy going stuff. His digital hardware was seized and his business accounts have been frozen as a result of that. So what we've got here is a clear public message and a rapid response by HMRC. I don't think, well, I certainly wasn't expecting any kind of action like this to be taken, certainly not for the next few months at least anyway. But they're obviously looking into claims, they're reviewing claims, they have said in their guidance that they will check claims and review everything that's being submitted to them. So that's why absolute care must be taken. Interestingly, HMRC have targeted the individuals in this case and not the actual corporate body. But um, at this moment in time, it's not particularly clear whether the Criminal Finance Act um, 2017 would be used in other cases to pursue corporate bodies. And that, of course, applies to people who might have indirectly, unwittingly assisted those people to commit that fraud. So uh, all advisors need to be, to be aware of that potential situation. Um, if arrests uh, and criminal sanctions are not imposed, then what we're looking at is the retrospective clawback of funds which have been uh, claimed under the furlough scheme. Those funds are converted under the under the legislation to uh, tax due. So if you've claimed £60,000 in furlough and you've claimed it incorrectly, that £60,000 transforms itself into a tax liability with penalties. So moving on to the civil enquiry side of things, we're anticipating that the vast majority of CJRS overclaims are unlikely to be dealt with by way of criminal prosecutions. It's only going to be the, the very worst cases that do that. So um, within the provisions of the Finance Act 2020, which became the Finance Act at 22nd of July, of course, um, CJRS or other COVID-19 support payments which aren't properly due will be clawed back. And as I said before, that funding then converts itself to either an income or corporation tax liability. And um, it applies, of course, to CJRS and the other support schemes that are in place as well. There's a 100% maximum penalty where it can be proven that um, the, the action taken was deliberate and concealed. Um, and for genuine errors, um, there is now an amnesty in place whereby the employer has 90 days to notify HMRC. So three months to notify them from the later of um, 22nd of July, which was when Royal Assent was received on the finance bill and uh, when the income tax or corporation tax becomes chargeable and I've put some links at the bottom of the slide for further information on that. So moving on to the job retention bonus which I call CJRS3. When's it going to end? You might end up at CJRS10 at some point, you never know. Um, employers will receive a one-off payment of a thousand pounds. This is across the UK um, it's for every furloughed employee who remains continuously employed through to the end of January 2021. The employees must earn above the lower earnings limit um, on average between the end of the 
CJRS scheme ending and the end of January 2021. And the payments will be made from February 2021. Okay, so that's £1,000 per employee. Further detail about that scheme is supposed to be being announced by the end of July. Um, it is now the end of July, as we're all aware, but usually HMRC make their announcements on a Friday so that I've got to spend the weekend reading them. Um, I'm sure it's got something to do with that anyway. I'll just move on to the next slide. A little bit about tax-free childcare. You may have heard about this. Um, this is to do with critical care workers. There's a definition of a critical care worker on the slide, but essentially it's the, the same people whose, uh, whose children were able to access school education after the lockdown. Uh, but there is a link to the definitions if anybody needs to know. Um, the maximum income threshold for critical care workers um, who have probably been doing lots of overtime, etc., has been increased from uh, 100,000 to 150,000. And it's for the 2021 tax year only. Okay, so it ends next March or next April, really. Um, and uh, basically, the regulations, those same regulations, the SI 202656, uh, also amend the childcare account rules from the 21st of July this year um, to allow permitted payments under those accounts. They will include payments to intermediaries for the purposes uh, of paying a childcare provider. So that just gives people a little bit of extra scope. Who are working as critical care workers. So the, here's a little bit about the, uh, the testing arrangements. You may well have, have uh, noticed that um, if an employer uh, was to fund the, uh, the testing of their employees um, for whatever reason, um, then our original policy discussions with HMRC were a bit disappointing because um, unfortunately due to the the, the nature of the, the way that the benefits code is laid out, HMRC were not in a position to exempt those payments uh, from benefit in kind treatment. So uh, unfortunately, they had to issue guidance to say that those uh, testing arrangements would form a benefit in kind um, to their employees. Um, and the only thing that could be done would be for the individuals to have had to suffer a tax uh, charge through the P11D or the employer would have had to have borne the cost of it through a pay-as-you-earn settlement agreement, which obviously we, we, we all thought was completely unsatisfactory and unfair. Um, luckily, Mel Stride stepped in with his Treasury Select Committee um, they decided that there'd been a completely disproportionate effect on employees and employers. Um, and uh, the revenue issued some revised guidance. So I've put a link to that. It does confirm that no benefit in kind arises in that respect now. What we're not clear on yet is when we do have an immunisation programme available, if employers wish to um, you know, pay for immunizations, et cetera, uh, such as they do at the moment with the flu jab, for example, um, then we're not clear on, on what the benefit in kind position is on that, but we're waiting for clearance, uh, waiting for clarification on it as well. So we'll uh, inform you about that in due course as soon as we know. Um, and just a little bit on test and trace, which um, is now operational and how it interacts with statutory sick pay. Uh, there is some updated guidance, I'll put a link there to that. Um, this is for employees who have received specific notifications um, from the test and trace system through the NHS uh, on or after the 28th of May. Um, they need to pay their employees SSP from the first qualifying day and there aren't any waiting days. Usually you've got um, four waiting days before you can pay anybody any statutory sick pay. But uh, the only qualification in this regard is that the individual has to be absent for at least four consecutive days. 
so um and we've got updated uh, guidance now as well haven't we on the the extended uh, period but which somebody has to self-isolate so uh, what happens is the individuals will receive a test and trace notification when they've been in contact with someone who's tested positive for coronavirus um, and the SSP entitlement will come to an end after 14 days um, after the most recent contact with whoever has tested positive. Um, the notification can specify sometimes that that period ends sooner than 14 days and if that's the case that's when the SSP comes to an end. Okay. And finally a um, plan for jobs has just been issued by the Chancellor. There's various documents on this and I've, uh, I've put them on that link there. Um, they were announced by, by Rishi Sunak in the, on the 8th of July. Um, they are UK wide measures um, where spending decisions are devolved, then what will happen instead of specific measures being, being put in place like they are in England, for example, um, the devolved jurisdictions will receive additional Barnet and fiscal framework funding arrangements for that because they've got their own specific arrangements in place. So just to give you an example of what's been done there, um, the Kickstart scheme is an incentive for 16 to 24 year olds throughout Great Britain. So um, the national minimum wage would be payable for 25 hours a week on a six month work placement for them. Um, apprenticeships just for England because Scotland and Wales, et cetera, have got their own um, arrangements for apprenticeships um, there's a range of ages available and for each different age range there's a different employer bonus available to people in England who are taking on apprentices um, high value courses again this is an English incentive but Scotland and Wales would be doing their own thing and that's for 18 and 19 year olds. And I think that's a little bit like the, the old YTS scheme, if any of viewers out there are, are as old as I am and can remember that. Um, there's also an expanded youth offer, which again is across Great Britain uh, for 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, and there's also a job finding service for people with less than three months unemployed of any age. And that's across Great Britain. Okay, so I shall now hand you over to Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. Um, I'm now going to talk about some of the, the other things and starting off with the self-employed income support scheme. Um, HMRC have published a compliance fact sheet, which is uh, aptly named because it talks about nothing other than um, getting their money back if you've claimed in error either uh, deliberately or um, inadvertently. So um, quite a few important points on that. First of all, that there is a notification period um, and that is the latest of the 20th of October 2020 or 90 days after, sorry, there's a days missing there, 90 days after receiving the grant. So that's quite a narrow window um, to report back to HMRC if you have claimed an error. Um, they will then make an assessment and you've got 30 days to pay and interest will be cha charged if you haven't paid within 31 days of uh, receiving that assessment. So quite a tight time scale and, and you know, I, I can only um, surmise that this is geared towards getting as much money back as possible because penalties will then fail or will then apply after that um, sort of window of, of allowing you to, to sort things out. Uh, a couple of really important points. Um, if you um, fail to notify HMRC and you knew that you weren't entitled to the grant, they will treat that as deliberate and concealed, which means that they will go straight for the 200% penalties. Um, so they will just basically not play nice on that. Um, and there are some 
but ironically, actually, just as a <laughs> uncharacteristically generous move by HMRC, um, if you didn't know you were liable when you claimed, the penalty will not be applied um, unless you haven't repaid by the 31st of January 22, which is when your self-assessment return is due. So there must be some link in their mind between um, doing your tax return uh, and, and, and then becoming aware that you weren't entitled to claim um, and then um, you know, actually charging the penalty. So that's a wee bit of a strange one, I think. Um, some specific provisions to do with partnerships. Um, if the money was paid direct to the partner, then only that partner will be liable for any interest and penalties. But if it was paid into the partnership, or if the partner then paid it onto the partnership, then the partners will be joint and severally liable for the interest and penalties and repaying it back so they can go after um, you know, a partner or any of the others in, in the partnership. So that's really quite important, especially if you are a partner. Next slide, please. Um, moving on to some other um, business support that have been introduced since the last time we did a roundup. Um, eat out, help out. Um, everybody knows we're all lining up our, our bookings for August. Um, Monday to Wednesday, £10 ahead between the 3rd and the 31st of August. It's essentially a grant and you'll claim it as such, um, amount, you know, equivalent to the amount of the discount. Um, the businesses who are um, going, the restaurants, wherever that are going to offer this, um, have to have been registered as food businesses before the 7th of July this year. So that could be an important cutoff that you need to watch with clients. And also you do have to actually apply to go into the scheme. Um, I'm not quite sure when the deadline for that is, but it's pretty soon. So um, I think it's the middle of um, August is the latest you can do it, but I would need to check that actually. But there is you know, a deadline for actually getting into the scheme as well. It doesn't apply to takeaways, it doesn't apply to caterings, and it doesn't apply to the wee vans by the roadside. So it's really geared towards sit down restaurants. The next one is uh, the temporary VAT reduction um, from basically in the middle of July until the middle of January next year, 5% on supplies of food and non-alcoholic drink. And it also applies to accommodation and admissions to attractions across the UK. Um, that uh, means that actually a take, or a, 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 that does apply to takeaways. Um, so you could actually have a takeaway business that has to operate five or sorry, three different rates of VAT, 0%, 5%, and 20%. And I can just see that being a complete nightmare um, for small businesses that have to either adjust their tills, um, because doing that is not always the easiest thing to do, um, or uh, especially if they do it on the sort of plastic or the, the paper bag by the side of, you know, <laughs> the cash or whatever. You know, it's just, a, it, it, it's wide open to people getting it wrong. So if you deal with, um, businesses in that sector, then I really think they will need a fair bit of help on that. Um, just a caveat here, we're um, sort of headlined at the beginning of this webinar as being experts. Um, I'm going to say that I know absolutely nothing about this um, other than what's written down there. Um, the National Basic Support Scheme, it's also known um, as the Agricultural Loan Scheme, 340 million of Scottish government money, um, basically uh, farmers and crofters can get 95% of their basic payment scheme and greening payment up to a maximum of 134 questions or 34,000. If you have any questions on that and especially about um, BPS and greening payments then please don't put them in because I do not have a clue. Um, so moving on, um, just some other smaller uh, loans and whatever that are available. Uh, or grants, a grant for childcare tra transitional support fund, um, 11.2 million being set aside by the Scottish Government to support nurseries essentially and uh, childminders. It's towards money for extra cleaning costs, for uh, adapting outdoor space for use um, and for additional signage and whatever. We've already talked previously about the Business Loan Scotland scheme, it's just really in there as a reminder. And uh, the Resilience and Recovery Loan Fund is a, uh, a, again, a Scottish thing, which is 
I shout it to across the UK, a um, hundred million, sorry, a loan available between a hundred thousand and one point five million um, for between twelve months and five years. So far, there's actually only been eighteen grants made um, through this, totaling six million pounds. So it's not a widespread thing. Um, I, I, I'm not sure why the take up has been so low, but. Um, you know, if you do act for charities, it's maybe worth looking at, but there certainly hasn't been a huge number of claims on that one. Um, so just basically as a reminder there of, of closing dates, just to, to have that as a bit of easy reference, I'll not go through them. And um, there's more information on the business assistance fact sheet, which there's a link to in the slides, which will be put around afterwards as well. Um, and Next slide, deferral of self-assessment payments on accounts. We, we now know how this is going to work. Um, and essentially it, statements that go out between now and the end of July uh, <coughs> um, will have a due date of the 31st of January 21 on them, not the 31st of July 2020. And the payment for July 2020 can be deferred until the 31st of January 21. Taxpayer does not need to apply for the deferral. If you don't pay it, it will be deemed that you have claimed that deferral. Um, but an important thing to remind all your clients are that if they do not want to pay it at the end of July and they have a direct debit in place with HMRC, they will have to cancel that direct debit because HMRC won't. So if you think it's okay, they'll do everything for you. Yes, they will. They'll even take the money unless you cancel the direct debit. So that's a really important thing to make clients aware of. And, and, and probably just as important actually is to remind them that if they do defer the payment at the end of July, then the one at the end of next January is going to be a triple whammy. It's going to be an absolute stonker because they're going to have the 31st January, um, July, sorry, 31st July payment on account that was due, they're going to have the um, 31st of January balancing payment that was due, and then they're going to have the payment and account for next year due. So triple whammy could be really quite painful. Need to plan the cash flow. Um, and the, the other point, I suppose, is that if things do improve between now and then, um, you can make payments to it any time. So it's not a case of, um, you know, if you don't pay now, you can only pay at the end of January. You can pay any time in between now and then. I'm going away from sort of government support schemes and things now to uh, the other breaking news in the last week or so, making tax digital. Um, I'm not going to go through sort of too much on that other than to say that uh, the, all that registered businesses now have to be um, MTD by April 2022 and all other businesses for uh, self-assessment essentially if you have a turnover of more than £10,000 by April 2023. Um, we have a, a webinar planned in a fortnight's time, which will be hosted by Michelle Mullen and Philip McNeil and Charlotte Barber from the tax team. And I will be on that um, and we will look at that in much more depth and the implications of that both uh, for your clients and for you. So I would encourage you to, to join us for that. But that is just a real sort of flag. The rationale behind it seems to be that we have done such a super job of um, sort of dealing with things and getting schemes up and running fairly quickly um, through COVID. Um, so HMRC must be entirely capable of doing this, um, you know, in the time scales that are there and so must the profession. So that seems to be the thinking behind it. Um, a couple of other just small things, and then we'll go to the questions. Uh, return to Office Working Toolkit, which uh, we published a few weeks ago, um, we've made some updates to that. Uh, if you are still sort of in the process or thinking about getting staff back into the offices, I thoroughly recommend that. It's an absolutely brilliant um, piece of work um, and will will help you enormously. And finally, just back to tax again for a, a quickie, uh, residential property transactions, uh, just to, the change in the SDLT or the LBTT in Scotland or the LTT in Wales, um, Northern Ireland, I'm not sure what's happening there. Apologies if we have anybody in, in my home country. Um, but yes, changes to that, whether it has the desired effect of stimulating 
um, the property market or not remains to be seen. Um, but at least there have been some efforts to um, to help um, the state agents and just get property moving again. So that's all from me for now. Over to David. Jeremy, Justine, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, a lot of information there um, in a relatively short period of time. So um, as I, the, the slides will be available for uh, download from icast.com afterwards. Uh, sorry, that's icast.com forward slash webinars, uh, which will also have this uh, recording of the webinar uh, there as well. So uh, certainly a few questions uh, coming in uh, throughout the, the course of that webinar. And again, if anyone uh, still wants the opportunity to ask questions, uh, please just uh, put them in the, 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 the Q&A facility uh, that's, that's there. Um, Jeremy, perhaps um, if I could come to you first of all, there's obviously been quite a number of grants um, announced in, in, in recent weeks. Um, and you know, I guess the, the, the question that's been asked is, you know, when is, when is there going to be an end to the, to, to the grants and will there be new grants becoming available and, 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 and such like? So is, is there any indications of that? Um, uh, when will there be an, 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 an end to this pandemic? <laughs> this is the answer because I think governments may well try and, and keep that going for, for quite a while. Um, Kate Forbes, when she was on um, our webinar last week, sort of indicated that they were constantly looking at things. And I think certainly the Scottish government will continue to um, look at what they can do to support various industry sectors. And I'm sure the UK government will do the same. Uh, actually, last night, late yesterday, there was a, an announcement from the Scottish government um, for the tourism sector, um, a £14 million hotel recovery programme. Um, so it's larger grants of up to a quarter of a million quid for um, bigger hotels. Um, and also uh, a million pounds for the self-catering accommodation sector. Um, One-off grants of £10,000 to see you through the winter, as they put it. Um, expressions of interest for the bigger grants for the larger hotels. Interesting expressions of interest by late August, um, but for the smaller grants, applications will open early August. Um, but you need to get in quick because if uh, the grants are £10,000 and there's only a million quid available, if my maths is right, that's only 100 grants available. So, you know. <laughs> You better get in, better join the queue quickly. Um, and then this morning, the UK government announced um, £20 million of new grants in England and Wales, so not Scotland, England and Wales, between one and £5,000 for new equipment, technology and advice, including accountancy advice, um, to sort of get you more um, digitally able to operate, if you like. Um, so between one and 5,000, 20 million quid's worth. Again, between 4,000 and 20,000 of those grants available. A bit more, but there's uh, seven and a half million small businesses in, in the UK. So again, they're, they're a bit thin in the ground. Um, but I suppose as a, a certain supermarket would say, every little helps. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I do think there will be sort of more and more coming out over time, but um, it really is literally, I mean, we had that conversation, you know, uh, this morning just about the one that was announced this morning. It is that fast. They're coming sort of thick and fast. You really got to keep your eyes open to it. Um, so, yeah, I think absolutely there will be more. And I think, uh, you know, as, as we've um, always said throughout the, the, the whole course of this pandemic, I guess, it, is you know information is coming out and changing relatively fast so you know we, we will try and keep up to date with it as much as possible you mentioned earlier on there the uh, business uh, assistance uh, fact sheet that's available on uh, icast.com yeah. um, so that's in, on the coronavirus hub uh, there's a separate business assistance page uh, there's a downloadable fact sheet that's there which we do keep up to date um, as and when announcements are made on new funding uh, mechanisms and, and, and such like. So we'll be updating for those latest last two announcements um, during the course of today and, 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 and making that available there. Um, 
continuing on that theme of fast developing and I'm going to absolutely land this one on Justine because uh, as we've been on the webinar um, I understand that there's been an announcement that um, the, the self-quarantine um, time scale is, is no longer going to be seven days but it's now going to be ten days uh, yeah. a, a, a across the UK. That must have implications on um, statutory sick pay uh, elements of, of that and you know do we anticipate that that statutory sick pay period will, will, will be extended as well? Um, well it may well be. Um, I was watching morning TV this morning and I was just thinking my slides <laughs> because <laughs> they they um they made these announcements about the uh, the extension and i thought oh no you know i've just written these slides about ssp claims and stuff but um i imagine that if there is something to change in that it will be changed over the course of perhaps the next week by hmrc um i guess we i mean the people who are in charge of um, SSP is technically the DWP, um, but they're channeling all their comms through um, HMRC in, in terms of COVID. So I guess we'll we'll hear about that in due course. But it may well be that there there is a little extension to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And do, does the SSP situation also apply in terms of? I guess quarantine's coming back from the likes of Spain now, uh, where, where that's been introduced. So if, if, if you're not able to uh, continue to work, you know, so if your place of work is um, a manufacturing factory or, 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 or something like that, mm -hmm. and you're having to now quarantine, is, is there any possibility of um, employers getting any form of reimbursement uh, through SSP or, or anything else for that? Well, uh, we're, what we're hearing at the moment is, and, and actually I haven't really heard anything from HMRC on this. It's more what's been in the news. Um, and what we're hearing is that people are being told that they've either got to take annual leave or take unpaid leave um, to cover the period that they've got to self-isolate for when they return from places like Spain. Uh, where there's been this shutdown, so or, or this this thing done by the, to, to them by the UK government, as it were, but um, it, it, there's not really any clarity on that situation at the moment. I imagine that um, now that the period of quarantine for self isolation has been extended as well, tied into the SSP, uh, and whether that will be extended or, or reviewed for people who've been away in Spain. Um, Probably next week we'll hear more about that from, from HMRC. There has been a couple of representations from um, the Employment and Payroll Group members to HMRC about these situations. So they do know that they need to provide some kind of response on it. Yep. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of questions coming in on the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. And uh, Jeremy, perhaps I could... Um, ask you on, on, on some of those. Uh, it, it, um, so the v first one is, is there a minimum spend? Um, so for instance, uh, if somebody went into um, an establishment and bought a coffee uh, on a Monday to, uh, to, to, to Wednesday, um, does that qualify for, for the 50% discount? Um, and linked to that, can the same customer claim this, uh, the discount more than once per day in the same, the same establishment? But in different transactions. I'm not sure if you're able to respond to that or... Uh, I, I, I will do my best but I will caveat it with um, we might want to read the uh, actual sort of published answers afterwards which may change from what I'm about to say now uh, after I've gone away and researched it. Um, on, on the coffee front, well first of all as far as I'm aware there's not a minimum spend. Um, so it's, it's up to forty pounds, and you will get um, you know ten ten quid per head, basically. Um, I don't know where the forty pound comes from. It's ten pounds per head. That's your family, um, Jeremy. That's my the, family, the, not the yours. That's right. Family, that's right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> See, I've just done that in my head. Um, so uh, up to ten pound a head. I, I, I've not heard any mention of a minimum spend <laughs> anywhere. In, t in terms of a coffee, I think if it's a sit-down coffee with a bun or whatever, then it probably does apply. 
But if it's a takeout coffee, it does not because the eat out help out does not apply to takeaways. Um, and finally, can does it apply per person, if you like, over the course of a day? I would say the answer to that is no. Um, it applies to the establishment. Mm. Um, so I don't think you can come in and out and sort of do that. But could you go for more than one meal a day? Yes, absolutely. Go have your breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, I, I think that's perfectly allowable under the scheme because you can get that 10% uh, per, per, per meal um, per establishment. So, um, But if you went back to the same place every time, I think that might be a problem. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of my thinking on it. But th thank you for whoever sent that question. And that's an absolute stonker. Um, we will do a wee bit of research round about that <laughs> and uh, put the real answer um, in the uh, in the sort of published help sheets, which will be available probably on Monday now because that might take a wee while to work through. <laughs> no, I, I think it is fair to say that uh, there is guidance available on gov.uk, which uh, goes through a number of uh, situations, uh, which helps people to understand how the how how the scheme works and how. Um, the interaction works with you know things like other discounts um, or uh, th th those sorts of things. You know, two for one offers and and, and all the rest of it. Uh, I have had a quick look at that uh, guidance just as, as as you've been talking there, Jeremy, um, and it doesn't actually cover anything around whether um, somebody can use the same establishment more than once in the day and such like. As with a lot of HMRC guidance, it appears you know they're all very straightforward examples, and the the real life practicalities are are, are perhaps not covered as as well. Well, um, on, on that basis, David, we'll maybe cover that when we come back to uh, another update in a couple of weeks time or whatever um, and we will go away and ask HMRC the question. <laughs> Entirely, absolutely. Um, uh, related to that, um, a, a question in for, for, from David uh, who's asked, is there any restriction on uh, restaurants putting up prices on, you know, having a, price, a Monday to Wednesday price list and then a rest of the week price list? Okay, um, I'm going to dig back. I will qualify this answer by saying that I, I, I have a legal background in education, but I am not a practicing lawyer. And, and therefore, what I'm about to say is digging back into the depths of my memory. Um, but there is a concept in law of unjust enrichment. And I suspect that if HMRC were to see two menus, a Monday to Wednesday menu, and then a rest of the week menu with different um, you know, prices on it and uh, the Monday to Wednesday menu being inflated, then I suspect that they would certainly look at it and under the concept of unjust enrichment, which um, in the vernacular is, you know, taking the mickey, um, then I think they, they, they would have a, have a reasonable case to pursue something on that. So if your clients are contemplating doing something like that, I think the best advice that you can give them is don't. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for, for, for that one. Um, Justin, coming come back to you, um, you mentioned obviously uh, CJRS um, and, and the, the, the new position. Is, is there any difference um, from in, uh, under CJRS 2, if you like, um, with the original uh, furloughing position around redundancy pay and the interaction with that? Um, no. Um, the, the, the employer can still furlough someone, um, but they can't use the furlough payment to fund the redundancy payment. So during the period of notice, perhaps, they might be still furloughing them because they can't, they can't work. Um, but when it comes to actually paying the redundancy payment, whether that's a statutory redundancy payment or a pay in lieu of notice or a top up or, you know, whatever they choose to, to pay them and what the, whatever they agree to pay them, um, that has to be funded by the employer. So it's only the actual furlough payment that can be used for furlough. Okay, but notice periods are covered under CGRS claims. Yeah, yeah, the employee can work effectively furlough out their notice period. Um, that's okay because they're, you know, 
they would otherwise be working their notice period, but they're on furlough. They're still employed. Yep. Um, they just can't that, work. In terms of CGRS3 or the uh, job retention bonus um, uh, element of, of, of that, if somebody was to be put on notice, um, you know, prior to the end of uh, January next year, but not actually finish until sometime in, in, in February, is the employee, is the employer still going to be able to uh, claim the, the job retention bonus? I imagine they would be because technically speaking, that person is still on the payroll and they've been continuously employed. So, so okay. it's only where the, the employment, if the employment's officially terminated and they've left and they've had a P45, then obviously they're not employed anymore. But while, while ever they are technically an employee of that business, then um, they should be able to claim the bonus for them if they're still there at the end of January. And I'm assuming there's still further guidance to be issued um, on CJRS3, given that that's uh, s still some time away. I think the, the, the still yeah, further definitely. guidance to be issued. So yeah, there might I be mean, some further clarity around that in, in the guidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're, we'll be you know lobbying HMRC to produce clear guidance on all of this by the time this bonus becomes payable. So hopefully uh, we will have encompassed all those kinds of queries into that. But the whole point of the bonus is that people are retained and the employer then qualifies for a bonus. If they aren't continuously employed throughout the period, um, let's say they were made redundant and taken back on, then they haven't been continuously employed. So yeah. the employer wouldn't qualify for the bonus. Okay, thank you for, for, for that. Um, in relation to the, the actual hours uh, calculation that you mentioned almost right at the, at the top of your section, um, there, there's a question come in around how does that affect um, seasonal variable employees and, and their normal working hours? How, how, how's that interacted with it? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Refer to guidance, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, seasonal workers, as actually, there's an interesting representation that was made by, um, I think it was the Chamber of Commerce or some, or the local authority or something, uh, for Scilly and Cornwall, uh, due to seasonal workers um, being so badly um, left out because of the original um, cut-off date. Uh, which was in February. And as we know, the, the, the cutoff date is now the 19th of March, which enabled people to have people on their real-time information returns at the 19th of March, where they weren't on the returns in the middle of February because no seasonal workers were required at that point. Mm -hmm. So that included a lot of people, and it was purely because of a representation uh, that was made by uh, Silly and Cornwall in that respect as well. So that I think that in itself included about another 200,000 workers, just that move of making uh, that, that, you know, bringing it forward by a month kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in terms of seasonal workers, they are really variable pay workers. So the guidance on variable pay, which was issued with CJRS1, applies to seasonal workers because you have to look at what the working patterns were last year um, and leading up to the, the 19th. Um, but if there's specific queries about whether people were or were not on a payroll uh, by the 19th of March 2020, then I would recommend having a web chat with HMRC because trying to call them is useless. You'll, you won't get through and you might not get a proper answer. But if you web chat them, you can write down the detail of your specific query and then HMRC can come back and answer that. Um, but the, 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 the contractual hours and the usual hours will need to be worked out using the variable hours calculations. Justine, if you do a web chat, sorry, David, if you do a web chat, can you then, like most web chats, get a transcript of that? I should imagine you can, yeah. I mean, um, I haven't tried it myself, actually, because I don't need to, to do that, you know. 
Um, so obviously, so obviously just, that would give you the but, evidence that you have followed yeah, what they say, which yeah, would be definitely. quite useful I mean, you can do a, down the line. Screen, I guess you can do a screenshot and, um, mm. you know, obtain a transcript that way. Um, but yeah, web chat's definitely turning out to be the best option for employers with queries. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who, uh, for instance, you know, works uh, different hours during a summer period from a from a winter period, for, for instance. So, you know, perhaps they work in the hotel and um, you know do reduced hours dur during the winter because it's not as busy and, and, and such like. Uh, mm -hmm. How do the how does the usual hours calculation work for for, for that situation? Yeah, again, um, that's a variable hours um, situation. So the guidance on variable hours needs to be looked at and you need to calculate what their contractual hours were in, in that respect. But again, it, these situations, every single employee in the UK that's got variable hours or a, or a that they're not basically a standard, bog standard monthly paid person or a weekly paid person. Um, everybody's got these nuanced situations and to clarify those for each person, the best thing to do is, is have a web chat. If you can't work it out from the guidance, if it's not immediately obvious, have a web chat because apart from anything else, you can have, as Jeremy's just said, you know, have a, have a transcript of that conversation. It all counts as well towards your record keeping and your thinking behind how you've calculated that furlough claim, which as we've seen, from this webinar is very important when it comes to keeping records for six years. Yep, absolutely. And um, Jeremy, I guess on similarly themed with that, latest warnings around the uh, incorrectly claimed CGRS, etc. Are professional firms who have furloughed staff and claimed CGR, uh, CGRS at risk, especially if they continue to receive month monthly fixed fees for compliance work? It's a question that's been asked. Yeah, Justin can jump in here if, if I say anything silly here, but I, I, I don't think you should sort of conflate, if you like, um, receiving money in and working. So if you have staff that are furloughed and are genuinely not working, but you are still getting money in on fixed fee arrangements, then I think that's absolutely fine. Um, the only thing is you're going to have a, a pretty busy back end of the year, <laughs> um, you know, um, because obviously they can't be doing the work, but if, you know, and, and even if you have split staff where you maybe have some staff on um, furlough, um, but there's other staff doing compliance work, like doing VAT and payroll and whatever, then, you know, and you're getting fees in for, for other, you know, those elements and other elements, I don't think that's a problem. Um, the timing of, of, of the payment is not what the issue is. Um, it's whether you've got people working or not. Um, yeah, and I think also there's an issue about whether, you know, like, for example, if a director goes out and sells something, mm -hmm. you know, but he's supposed to be on furlough, but he's trying to get something for further down the line or negotiate some kind of sales deal or something a bit further down the line, that can be called into question potentially. Yeah. So if a fixed fee is coming in as a result of, some kind of negotiated process that's happened while somebody's been on furlough mm. um, I would say that needs to be kind of looked at in terms of its own nuanced situation yeah but um, it's it's the work it's the doing of yeah. the work that's the issue it is. not the payment for it I think yeah um, so you know yeah. if you're getting paid in advance for something that you're going to do down the line um, and that arrangement was in place before furlough then yeah. that's fine. Um, obviously, if you go out and renegotiate it while you're on furlough, that's not. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, that, that, that's that's my take on it. It's it's not not an issue as long as you don't have the staff working to to do the work during furlough. Okay, that's that's great. We're we're almost uh, out of time uh, just now. Just one final question that's just come in here just now, which um, I'll. Uh, just just respond to um, it's talking about uh, an employee comes back off furlough on a phased basis um, and what's the position of staff being encouraged to take annual leave um, for the day or two a week that they're on furlough when they're working the rest of the week so I you know f filling out their week so that they're, that they're off 
uh, in, on furlough and then encouraged to take the annual leave the, the, the other period. Uh, th there is some HMRC guidance available um, on gov.uk which talks about uh, annual leave uh, entitlement. The, the basic position uh, as we understand it um, is that employers are uh, entitled to ask employees to take annual leave uh, as and when they, they, they require to do so, as long as it's reasonable. Um, so therefore, you know, it, it, the same position is, is, is going to apply to that. Um, but as I say, I would recommend having a look at the, the guidance on uh, gov.uk around that. Um, and as always, if, if in doubt around those sorts of things, um, the advice of employment specialist lawyers um, should, should be taken with that. So, Jeremy, Justine, thank you very much uh, for your, your time this morning. Uh, say we're just over 12 o'clock just now, so we do have to uh, call, a, call a halt to that. Uh, just now. So uh, say we do want to uh, thank you for your attendance. Um, we will put together a Q&A document um, which covers the, the questions and we'll make that available on icast.com forward slash webinar uh, later on. Um, as always, further information is available on the Coronavirus Hub uh, and also CA Connect. Um, as well as you also being able to answer and access support through the ICAST Technical Help Desk, uh, which covers a variety of uh, practice areas, audit and accounting, tax, practice support, AML and ethics. Um, you can ask your questions through that at any time. So it only leaves me uh, once again to thank Justin and Jeremy for joining me today and uh, for your insight into the various topic areas. Uh, I do hope that the webinar has been helpful to everyone attending. Uh, next week, we will be looking at how COVID has uh, impact on probably the most important resource within a practice, the people. Uh, so whether it be on the recruitment side as an employee looking to move or as an employer looking to recruit staff, the market has undoubtedly changed over the last few months. And similarly, the process for onboarding new staff performance management, disciplinary and grievance procedures uh, are all affected as uh, employers and, and employees work in a remote environment. So next week, uh, delighted to be joined by uh, Mark Lewis from Rutherford Cross uh, Recruitment Agency um, and also Louise McCosh, uh, who is Director and he Head of HR at French Duncan uh, for their insight into that. Uh, as Jeremy's already mentioned, uh, the week after that, on 13th of August, we'll return to a more detailed look at the more, most recent announcements in relation to making tax digital uh, and other aspects relating to the future of taxation in the UK. Links to sign up to those webinars and any, uh, all the other ICAST webinars are available on icast.com forward slash webinars and we will obviously be uh, continuing to send out to you the uh, emails to sign up as well. So as always, great to receive your feedback on this webinar and any future topics you'd like us to cover. Uh, please uh, let us know about that. Uh, but for the meantime and until next week's Ask ICAST webinar, goodbye. Thank you.